Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't. I had another meeting on Monday morning for a long time. So, I mean, your seminars look great. So many good speakers. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I just could not make it in the last semester. So, anyway, I'm glad to be here now. No, great. It's great to see you now. Working. Hi, Vito. Hello. Good hello, morning. everyone. Hi, hello, hello. Good morning. Hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. How are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing well. Okay, we can wait a little bit before we start. Victor, our time zones are okay now? Hey. You are the time zone keeper. Yes, yes, everything <laughs> is working fine now, yes. Thanks for figuring it Perfect. out for us. I mean, it's like too complicated for two poor scientists. It, it's already hard enough to find a time slot that works for a large group of people across the world, right? And then you have to keep track of all of these different time zones. It's almost impossible. Yeah. Wow, everybody's so quiet, nobody's speaking. We need to fill up the ether with uh, some talk. <laughs> Go ahead, Gilad, give a little speech. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Peter. Hi, Margaret. I can make a short advertisement that the APS March meeting is next year in person in Chicago. Oh, that's nice. Very and good. I'm the program chair for Division of Biological Physics. So. Oh, okay. If you're doing advertisements, I'll do I'll do one too. So the Biophysical Society meeting <laughs> will also be in person in San Francisco in February. We are going to have the Biophysical and uh, the Biological Fluorescence Subgroup meeting. Uh, the day before the BPS meeting, it's gonna have a gorgeous program, which will be announced soon. So, <laughs> anybody else has any <laughs> announcement? <laughs> Maybe you want to announce the GRC. <laughs> yes, sure. And announce a new government, Gilad. <laughs> yeah, and we have a new government in Israel. That's, that's the most wonderful uh, announcement one can make. We'll see how long it lasts. So. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. 
Oh, I see Ron. Good to see you, Ron Elber. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like I haven't seen you too many times on these. Yeah, I, I had something on Monday that I just could not move. But I'm, well, I'm, yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I have my training session that just ended three minutes ago, so. <laughs> That's why you I have know. not uh, missed even one uh, talk in this series. Right? Really? I, I'm, I oh, must so have during the, the, the crisis, the it, weather I... crisis. I must have. Yeah. At least. Well, thanks for joining us. It's so. a nice series. It's a nice series. I mean, I think it's a good field, you know? And I think <laughs> what I think is funny is I think that uh, I think the the more the, the the larger community sort of I mean the larger chemistry community and so on understands that, but I think they somehow never have learned the material. They've learned that something's going on there, but that's about all they kind of know. I would say, <laughs> but I think there have been a lot of ideas that have been useful in all many 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 other things. So uh, it's sort of too bad, but oh well, that's yeah. the problem with interdisciplinary work, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. So I think we should start. So uh, welcome everybody to uh, another webinar in the protein folding and dynamics series. Today we have with us uh, Elizabeth uh, Rhodes and it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce uh, Liz. Uh, Liz started her career as a PhD student in the University of Michigan with uh, Ari Gaffney. And then she uh, did the first postdoc in my lab at the Wetzon Institute and moved for a second postdoc to uh, Cornell University with Watt Webb. Uh, after that, she joined uh, uh, Yale University as an assistant professor and uh, went up in the ranks to associate professor before she moved uh, to the University of Pennsylvania to the chemistry department there. And uh, two years ago, she was promoted to uh, a full professor in, uh, in UPenn. Uh, Lisa's work has to do with uh, using single molecule uh, spectroscopy uh, uh, combined with functional studies in order to look on intrinsically disordered proteins, particularly, I guess, alpha-synuclein, tau, islet, amyloid peptide, polypeptide, and additional uh, such IDPs that have important functional implications, uh, especially for amyloid diseases. And uh, Lisa's uh, work is distinguished by the meticulous attention to the, this interface between the biophysical studies and the functional relevance of uh, the work. Uh, this uh, beautiful work that she has been generating has not gone unnoticed. Uh, two years ago, she received the uh, Barani uh, Award of the Biophysical Society, and she has also been an associate editor at the Biophysical Journal, where she's responsible for the whole uh, protein section with a large number of uh, editors that she's, uh, uh, she's basically directing in order to run that section. So with that, I will uh, actually uh, stop and let Liv talk. Just before that, let me remind you that you should uh, keep your uh, microphones mute throughout the lecture. But at the end of the lecture, we will have a uh, question and answer session that will go as long as you have questions. Uh, and we will let you, I will let you mute yourself one by one uh, and ask the question. So please just write your write that you have a question in the chat, and I will uh, uh, I will run this. Uh, one more point: uh, at, in the past, we sometimes had uh, Zoom bombers. Uh, recently, we did not suffer from that, so I'm not usually uh, locking the the meeting anymore. Uh, so let's hope it goes okay. Uh, but just in case you get somehow kicked out of the meeting. Uh, the meeting is also uh, um, on YouTube. It's uh, 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 right now live on YouTube and it will be there also after the meeting. Uh, uh, our YouTube uh, uh, channel is, is, seems to be quite successful. Every lecture there is being watched hundreds of times. So uh, feel free to go there and find Lisa's lecture later and also all the previous lectures 
Uh, so with that, I'll stop. Uh, so Liz, the floor is yours now. Uh, you can share your screen and start the talk. Thank you. All right. Um, so first, Gilad, thank you so much for that really lovely introduction. And thanks also to Ben and Hagen for inviting me to speak in this, uh, in this seminar series. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, as uh, Gilad already said, I'll be talking to you about um, uh, our, the, one of the proteins we study, which is a protein called tau, um, and tell you about our efforts to try and understand uh, basically its functional mechanisms. Um, I'll start off by just acknowledging all the people that do the work. So this is the socially distanced picture of my lab from back in fall last year, sort of as we were beginning to come back into the lab after having it been shut down for a few um, for a few months. Um, the people I've highlighted in orange are the are the members of Team Tau um, who are currently working on Tau in the lab. And then this, of course, is built upon you know the efforts of many other people in the lab who have um, who have uh, initiated these studies. Um, so I know that we've heard about disordered proteins and some of the other seminars um, in the series, but for those of you who haven't been to all of them, I don't want to belabor this, but the, the point of the slide, I think it's a really nice illustration of the fact that so many proteins we, we know well or think we understand well have disordered regions and that these disordered regions are important for function. So this is from the Scientific American paper from almost a decade ago now from Keith Sunker and Richard Kawaki pointing out that, you know, kinesin, um, the lining of the nuclear pore, and then P53, all well-studied proteins are all proteins where disorder is really important to how they work, even if we don't necessarily understand exactly how a disorder contributes to function, it is important to their functions. Um, and so the, what protein I'm going to tell you about today is a protein called tau. Um, so it's a, a microtubule binding protein. Um, it belongs to the class of microtubule proteins called MAPs. Um, so these are different just to distinguish that. So also shown here with kinesin, this is a motor protein walking along a microtubule. Um, these are also, um, to distinguish it from these motor type proteins, um, the MAPs do not uh, you know, use ATP or GTP for energy. They don't move along the microtubule lattice, but they're thought to bind and help stabilize or maintain the, the properties um, called dynamic instability of microtubules. So their ability to polymerize and depolymerize. Um, it, it's found primarily in the axons of the sort of central nervous system. Um, so these are the long projections that you can see in some of these images that come out of neurons. Um, and so they have very long microtubules in them and, and that's where tau is found. Its interactions with microtubules are regulated by phosphorylation. So we'll go into that a little bit more um, later. And, and there's also there's six naturally occurring isoforms in adults. There's one um, isoform in, in the uh, fetus and in developing brain, but in adults, you have six of these isoforms. Um, the reason we know tau or know so much about tau, or at least its relationship to disease, is because as, as Gilad alluded to, it's also one of the primary components of the aggregates that are found in Alzheimer's disease and other diseases which are collectively called tauopathies. Um, and so in this cartoon here, what it's illustrating is that you have two types of protein aggregates. You have the extracellular deposits, which are made primarily of A-beta, and then you have these intracellular deposits or neurofibrillary tangles, which are composed primarily of tau. Um, and, and so this has been known for quite some time now. And I think a lot of the, well, one reason we have a relatively poor understanding of tau is how it works is because so much effort has been put into understanding how it aggregates and why it aggregates in disease, I think understandably. And like many amyloid diseases, there are mutations in the actual aggregating proteins linked to disease. But in the vast majority of cases, there are no mutations to these proteins. So these are functional proteins that are aggregating um, without, in the absence of mutation. And so one of the reasons we study function of, of tau and other amyloidogenic proteins is to try and understand the link between function and loss of function in disease and how this may lead to, um, to aggregation. So you can, um, the, the two major questions I'm going to try to um, answer, or not answer, give partial answers for, and, and, and sort of our efforts to understand them. Um, we can be described as how does tau work and what does tau look like? Um, and the first part, I'm going to tell you what does tau look like? Um, and so just to go through this micrograph over here on the side. So this is um, with overexpressed proteins. This is actually in fixed cells. And, and so, but what it illustrates really nicely is that wherever you see tubulin or microtubules in the cell, you also see tau. Um, and so it, it clearly is, is you know, predominantly associated with, um, with microtubules or tubulin in, in the cellular environment. All right, and just because microtubules and tubulin are pretty critical to our studies, I want to remind everybody 
um, what these look like on a, on a, a finer level. Um, so again, we have another nice picture of a cell where you can see the microtubule network here stained in green going to all regions of the cell. Um, so the tubulin um, is, the, is the component that makes up microtubules. So it's an obligate heterodimer made up of alpha and beta subunits. These alpha and beta subunits will assemble into, um, into linear protofilaments. And these protofilaments basically wrap around um, and form this uh, microtubule. Depending on the organism, there's anywhere from 11 to, to 15 of these, of these protofilaments making up a microtubule. Um, they're distinguished by what are called the minus and plus end, where the plus end is where you have a, a higher rate of, of tubulin polymerization. So tubulin will add to this end of the microtubule to have growth. And they have shrinkage from this end where you'll have leaving of the, of the microtubule dimer, oh, sorry, the tubulin dimers from here. Um, and, and of course, in the, in the cell body, this, this minus end will actually be attached to the centrosome, um, which will help provide stability and organization for the microtubule. Um, this is not necessarily true in the, in the axons where you have these very long projections, um, but you still have some sort of proteins that bind to the end and help stabilize it. Okay, so to get to our question, which is what does tau look like? So this paper, they're actually back-to-back -back papers published by the Kirchner Lab in 1977, which was characterizing both purification of tau, so um, from, from mammalian sources, as well as its ability to polymerize tubulin into microtubules. So if you take a mixture of, of depolymerized uh, microtubules of tubulin and mix tau with it, it's capable of stimulating polymerization, lowering the critical concentration of, of tubulin, if you will. Um, and this is their um, part of their structural characterization of tau. Um, and what you're looking at is a CD spectra. And, and it's comparing the CD spectra, they actually characterize the structure in terms of the percent helicity of tau. That's how they wrote about it in the paper. And what they're doing is they're comparing it with the CD structure of myoglobin, which is you know, very, very alpha helical. And you can see the two negative peaks that we expect from a helical protein in myoglobin. And by contrast, you can say that tau does not um, does not have those negative peaks. They never describe tau as disordered in their paper, but they do describe it as lacking helicity. So they assign something like 10% helicity to it. So it's lacking helicity. But clearly we look at this now and we would say that's consistent with a random coil. This is not a highly structured protein. Um, and, and so that was, you know, that was, you know, for, 40 years ago that that was first characterized. Um, and then this is the sort of our linear, um, a projection of, of tau so we can look at the major domains. Um, and I want to go through that, uh, briefly, since that's important to the work that we're doing. Um, so we have the N-terminal domain, which is roughly the first 150 residues. Within this N-terminal domain, there are two inserts that are alternatively spliced out. So I mentioned the six isoforms of tau. So you have isoforms where you have both of these inserts present, where only the N1 is present or where neither one of them is present. So that makes up the, the N-terminal isoforms. You then have this proline rich region, um, which is about 25 to 30% prolines, um, which is stretches about 100 residues in the sort of middle part of the protein. It's flanked immediately by the microtubule binding repeats. So this is a region of the protein that has um, gotten most of the attention, and there's two reasons for that. Um, one, as the name suggests, it, it's the, thought to be the primary microtubule binding region. Um, the second is that there are short sequences within the repeat two and the repeat three here that are the primary drivers of aggregation um, and neurofibrillary tangle formation. So they, you can see minimal sequences that will drive aggregation and, and, and mutations to those will, will alter aggregation kinetics. And so that's why a lot of work has actually been done just on fragments that correspond to this microtubule binding repeat. So you have four of these. R2 is, the, is, is a, where you have splicing again. So you'll have isoforms that have all four of these and you'll also have isoforms that are missing R2. So those are typically called 3R and the four isoforms of tau. Um, so that the, the is sequence conservation among these repeats, but it's not very heavily concerned. You'll see some sequences later, um, but so, so some sequence conservation. Um, and you actually have higher conservation between microtubule binding repeats and other MAP proteins um, than within repeats in town. What I mean by that, if you look at MAP um, uh, 1C, for example, R1 of MAP 1C and R1 of tau are highly conserved, um, more so than between R1 and R2 of tau. And then this, this last domain over here, R prime is a domain that's gotten more uh, attention lately. It's also heavily, it, it's highly um, a conserved between species. It doesn't have the same kind of sequence um, conservation as the repeats do, but between different organisms, you have high conservation of R prime, and it seems to be, a, it's highly charged and it seems to be important for tubulin binding. 
Um, so this light line, this isoform is 441 amino acids, and then each of these inserts are about 30 residues each. And so you have you know, variations that are up to 90 residues shorter than that. Okay, so we, we don't care just about what tau looks like in solution or in the cytoplasm. We also care about what it looks like when it's bound to microtubules. So again, this is now work that's more than 15 years old by Andreas Hunger's lab. And what they were, were showing, this is um, an EM reconstruction where the microtubule lattice, which you can see over here on the far um, left, I guess, um, uh, where you can have the alpha and beta subunits of, of the tubulin marked. Um, in the middle, you have a microtubule where it's heavily decorated with tau, meaning as far as, as you know, experimentally possible, all the um, tau binding sites are saturated. And what you can see is that there is some increase in density, particularly along the ridge of the microtubule, but it's not a tremendous increase in density, even when tau is bound completely. And that suggests that even when tau is bound to microtubules, it's not becoming globular. It's not becoming heavily structured. And just for comparison, you have we have next to it a, a, a micrograph with both tau and kinesin. So kinesin being this nice globular um, motor protein. And you can see very easily the additional density that comes from kinesin, right? So if you want to contrast that to what tau looks like, this is what a globular protein looks like on the microtubule lattice. And this is what a, a you know, disordered protein looks like on the microtubule lattice. So that was 15 odd years ago. And then just a few years ago, we had a much higher resolution um, sort of model um, based on cryo-EM and, um, and um, modeling from the, from the Nogales lab where they were able to actually get some residue specific information about tau bound to the microtubule lattice. And I would say the conclusion that we have from this paper with all its beautiful detail is largely that tau is disordered when binding to the microtubule. So what this is showing you is actually this R2 repeat stretched out along um, the lattice of the microtubule. You can see that it sort of starts halfway through the beta subunit of one of these dimers and stretches to about halfway through the beta subunit of an of a adjacent dimer. This is moving along the filament. Um, and so the, the thought is that the repeats um, just lie along the surface like this, um, stretching along the, the length of the, of the microtubule filament. Um, and, uh, and actually it's interesting because one of the uh, sort of um, hypotheses that came out of the Kirchner work in 1977 was they noted the elongated shape of tau in solution and suggested that this elongated shape facilitates it binding along the lattice of the microtubule. And that, and that seems to be true. Um, so our question, this was, so the paper came out in 2018. We had an older paper where we had looked at tau binding to soluble tubulin. Um, and so th this is um, what we, let me move that bar so I can see my, I can't do that. Okay, so this is using a fragment of tau, which consists of the one of the proline rich regions and the four microtubule binding repeats. Um, the reason we use this when you're looking, people use some a fragment that looks like this when they're looking at microtubule or tubulin interactions is because despite the fact that the microtubule binding group region is called the microtubule binding region, it does not bind tightly unless you have at least part of the proline region, rich region there. So that's really required for binding. So, so studies tend to include this P2. And that's what we had done as well. Um, and so we were interested in looking at how tau binds to soluble tubulin, because one of the questions we have is that if we know that tau is capable of binding to soluble tubulin, how does it or does it need to distinguish between the soluble tubulin and the microtubule lattice? Um, and so we, this, this is the four repeats I told you. So you can see sort of the partial sequence conservation. It's not heavily conserved between the different repeats. Um, and what my student Xiaohan did is he took this repeat three and the reason we focused on repeat three was actually from other work in the lab, which suggested that it was maybe had the highest affinity for, for tubulin. And he mutated each of the residues within this conserved repeat region, all highlighted in red, except for the gray um, charge residues that we knew were important for binding. He mutated them to cysteine and he labeled them with acrylidan. Um, so he did this because acrylidan is environmentally sensitive fluorophore. Um, and so it, it will blue shift um, when the environment of the fluorophore changes. And that's what you're seeing here. This is the spectrum of acrylidan on tau in the absence of tubulin. And you can see we get a shift in our lambda max to lower wavelengths when it binds to tubulin. So Shahan carried out um, with a series of mutations, which each of these um, sequentially labeled with a acrylidan, he carried out this um, binding to tubulin and he um, characterized the, quantified the shift in the maximum wavelength um, as a function of position. And so what he saw was that you get this very periodic sort of series of, of, um, of signal changes um, when, it, when you bind to tubulin. 
So just to clarify, this is soluble tubulin we're adding, we're not adding microtubules. Um, and, and so we were trying to understand what this looks like in terms of how tau looks like when it's found the tubulin. And one of the things he did in analyzing this data is he projected it onto a helical wheel. And so what I'm showing you here is that is the helical wheel of that region of this R3 region of tau, um, first colored by the type of amino acid, and then over here colored by the relative shift. So how we analyze this is he calculated the average shift in the acrylidan fluorescence, and then he um, colored those blue, those that had a higher than average shift, and he colored red, the ones that have a lower than average shift. So the thing that was striking is that if you then projected these on a helical wheel, you got a pretty nice looking amphipathic helix in terms of the, the blue shifts were all on one side of the helix and the red shifts were all on the other side of the helix. And that led us to propose that it's possible that tau's repeat regions bound with short helical segments when it was interacting with tubulin, right? So there, there's something that confused us at this time about this data. And some of you may have already noticed it, um, but we, I, I mentioned that you have a, a shifting in the acrylidan signal when you have a change in environment. If you notice all of our blues, so our larger shifts, so the largest change of environment, line up really nicely with our polar residues as opposed to our aliphatic residues. So that's a little bit non-intuitive because we tend to think about aliphatic residues as the ones driving protein-protein interactions as opposed to polar residues, right? So we, we were confused by that. We honestly didn't understand it. Um, at the time, and um, but but it, we had a nice alignment, um, and so we, we proposed this model. Um, but then the cryo EM structure came out from the Nagalis lab, and it wanted made us sort of reconsider our model. Like, how can we reconcile the data that we observed um, with their cryo EM? So I had a, a new postdoc, um, Joyce, who set out to do exactly that. Um, so this was five years later. So we learned a few things about tau in between. So we were now working with a slightly different model construct. So this time we have both of the proline rich regions present as well as this R prime region. So that was the construct Joyce was working with. Um, and we still have these R sequences of our repeats. And so since Xiaohan had already looked at R3, um, Joyce chose to look at R2. And the reason she chose to look at R2 is because that was part of the, the high resolution data that was published um, in the cryo -EM structure was based on R2. Um, and so we thought that would be allow us to do a direct comparison. Um, so Joyce did the similar set of experiments using the acrylidan labeling. So what you'll see, this is her data just using two different concentrations of tubulin. And we could find that at about 10 micromolar tubulin, the signal saturated, which is consistent with what we'd seen before. Although you will notice that some of the finding sites seem to saturate at, at lower concentrations of tubulin. Um, we compared that to the prior data from Xiaohan. So this is actually Xiaohan's data in blue and Joyce's data in orange. And what you can see is that the overall sort of shape and periodicity of the two different regions is fairly comparable. Um, and she did one additional measurement in R3 to sort of show that that was not a spot that um, Xiaohan had looked at. And you can see that that sort of continues here. So we have fairly good agreement between the two different data sets. It also suggests that there's you know, similarities in the way the two domain repeats bind to um, tubulin, which we might've expected. But then she, she looked more closely in comparing our data with the cryo-EM data. So that's what I'm showing you here. Um, so this is the model she built based on the, the EM data that was deposited in the, in the PDB, um, where she's showing R2 in, in um, high resolution binding along, that's the beta, uh, sorry, the tubulin dimer there and then the adjacent uh, dimer right there, the beta subunit. Um, and she quantified this by calculating the accessible surface area of each of these chains and then plotting that along the x-axis and then the peak shift for that particular position of the acrylidam peak um, along the y-axis. Um, so if we, if we ignore this little cluster up here, which we'll come back to, you can see that again, there's a pretty good linear correlation between the surface accessibility and, and the delta and the shift in the lambda and the wavelength. So again, this is confusing, right? So, so these are saying those residues that are sticking out into solution are the ones that are showing, or away from the microtubule lattice, are the ones that are showing the largest shift in the, in the acrylidan spectrum, which is not necessarily what you'd expect. Um, but Joyce did a lot of digging around in the literature. And one of the things she found is that, you know, when acrylidan is in the excited state, it's a dipole. Um, and as a dipole, it can then interact, of course, with other charges. And the, one of the characteristics of the microtubule surface is that it's highly negatively charged. So what we're hypothesizing is that the larger shifts you see are actually because of the electrostatic, sorry, the, the electrolytic interactions between the, um, the 
charged dipole of the acrylidine in the excited state um, and then and the negative charge that resides on the on the surface of the microtubule. So if we want to look at more detail in these residues where we saw differences, um, what you'll see is that a lot of them are actually clustered over here at this interface between the alpha one subunit and the beta subunit, beta two subunit. Um, and so this is a region where um, if you're talking about a single tubulin dimer, that interface doesn't exist. It only exists if you have multiple tubulin dimers and if tau is sort of capable of, of aligning them um, next to each other, right? Because otherwise these are not going to be sensitive. And so one of the hypotheses we have is that maybe these, these residues um, show stronger changes in their environment because they are involved in, in mediating this interface between that, the um, tubulin dimers, basically. So, so it, by, we know that more than one tubulin dimer is bound by this construct. We don't, um, I'll get into more about why we don't have exact numbers for that, um, but we know it is capable of binding more. So one of the things we think these residues might be doing, which cluster over here, are helping to um, mediate that, that uh, dimer dimer interface between the tubulins. Okay. So going, continuing with our quest to find out more about what tau looks like, um, we then move to single molecule FRED, as, as Gilad alluded. Um, I, again, I think you've probably all, well, many of you are experts in single molecule FRET, and some of you, you've all heard about it. Just to clarify the type that we're doing here, we're doing diffusion-based FRET, where we have both of our fluorophores on the protein so we can look at conformational changes. And so we look at a lot of these histograms, which are built up of the bursts of photons as they diffuse through a, a, a focused laser beam. And we can, we can analyze this in a variety of ways to tell something about, um, about what tau looks like. Right. So um, this is a cartoon of tau again. What I'm now showing you are the labeling sites that we use. So we tend to use these in pairs, um, um, mean, meaning so like 17 and 149 is one pair, 17 and 433 is one pair. Um, and from the perspective of what are the data I'm going to show you, I'm showing you illustrating where we have it labeled at 291 and 433. I do want to note that many of these labeling sites are chosen because they flank specific domains, right? So for 149 to 244 example, flanks this proline rich region. And so we can use these as domain sensitive um, readouts of the conformations of specific domains. And so the data we're going to see now is tau in the absence and presence of tubulin. So in the absence of tubulin, we have this dark histogram. Um, and in the presence of tubulin, we have this light histogram. So all of the data is going to be color coded in the same way. For each construct, um, I have noted up here the two positions where the fluorophores are going to be. Um, so we did that. Well, we didn't do that. I should say my student, Kristen, did a tremendous amount of work to do this. And so she, what I'm showing you here are, are the six different sets of labeling positions she used to look at tau. Um, and, and so the, the thing you'll notice is that um, that for almost all of the data, well, actually all of the data, you have a shift um, when tau is in solution from a relatively high FRED efficiency to relatively low FRED efficiency. So that's uniformly true. Um, this is, um, we, we had prior work, um, both from us as well as some older ensemble FRED work from the Mandelkopf lab, which showed that when tau is in solution, it does have long range interactions between its termini and its microtubule binding region. Um, and so what, what we take these as uh, the shift in the signal as a loss of those long range interactions. Um, you'll also see that, um, you know, for example, in the certainly rich region, it's a relatively small shift. And the reason we think that is true is because this proline rich region is already fairly extended in the solution state. Um, and so there's, um, the, there's not much more extension that can occur for, for lack of a better description. All right, so I say Kristen did a tremendous amount of work. Um, sorry, that's our conclusion here. So we have you know, domain specific conformational changes and we're gonna look more in depth at that at the next slide. So I said Kristen did a tremendous amount of work. And so what I mean is that she looked at this in all of the uh, three different N-terminal isoforms of tau. And the reason she did this is because not much attention has been given to these N-terminal inserts. There's a lot of effort looking at the microtubule binding region, as I already said, and specifically um, at the isoform differences between those that are lacking or containing this R2, but much less attention has been paid to these N-terminal inserts. Um, so we were interested in to, to what degree that this N-terminus was influencing the conformations of tau and solution. So we're going to start off um, looking actually at tau bound to tubulin because it turns out that's a little less interesting. Um, it, it, I think it confirms what we know from the EM and from our prior 
um, single molecule fretwork, which is that tau binds tubulin in a fairly extended conformation. Um, and so what you see here is, I'm sorry, just a little bit. So we have these three isoforms. So these are indicated by the different um, shapes here. Um, and then we have the six different sets of labeling. So they're different colors. So you'll see there's 18, actually there's 24 different uh, spot points on each of these plots. The, the other six come from this, what we called our biophysical um, variant of tau, where um, rather than having the first insert present, we have the second insert present, but not the first insert. Um, and it was actually a cloning accident that we, that we made this variant. But it turns out from a biophysical perspective to be quite a useful variant um, because it allows us to test that that's not an, a naturally occurring isoform. And what it does is it allows us to test um, you know, sort of a, a naturally occurring variant um, with one that doesn't exist uh, naturally. Right. Okay. So what do we see when we look at this? We see that um, a lot of things that we like, right? So we basically see that if we look at variants where there's no difference in the, if we look at these purple, which is the 149 to 244, those are the same for all of our isoforms and those all cluster right together as we would expect. Um, we see those where we have an increase in residues due to the uh, presence or absence of one of these isoforms. We see this linear increase, I'm not linear increase, sorry, this increase that falls right along this dotted line. Um, and this dotted line is the, is the um, a sort of theoretical scaling factor you'd expect for a uh, a random coil and a good solvent, right? So we can see that when it binds to tubulin, um, we basically, a lot of the data points fall right along that line, which shows us that tau is kind of as extended as it can be. I will note that this 110 angstrom is where we sort of have our comfort level in terms of how accurate distances we can calculate with our fluorophores. Um, and so, um, you know, anything above that, we wouldn't consider the distance to be highly accurate. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, the, the fact that these fall off our line are not terribly concerning. So what turns out to be more interesting is if we look at tau in the absence of tubulin, right? So these are again, the exact same constructs, but these are our freight efficiencies um, converted to uh, root mean square distances um, using um, a, a, a worm-like chain and then um, as a function of number of residues. And so I'm gonna highlight some of the, the specific um, constructs here. Um, so the first cluster I have here, or what I would call our, uh, our peace of mind cluster or, or you know, sort of checking our data cluster. So um, we have both the purple and the blue are good gut checks because these are data, these are um, labeling positions, 244 and 291, and then uh, 291 and 433 that don't change between the isoforms. And you can see that our, our freight efficiencies, our RMS values all cluster right on top of each other. And so that's what we'd expect for these. And so that's a good peace of mind. Um, this green right here is 17 to 149. So this is looking just at our, I mean, our N-terminus here. And again, each of these differs by 30 residues. And what you can see is that we get a nice sort of scaling behavior. Um, it doesn't scale with the, with the Flory theory, but that's, that's fine. We don't necessarily expect that for this protein under non-denaturing conditions, but we do see that we get an increase in the RMS that scales with the number of residues present. And that for these two, which are the same length, you know, they, they fall right on top of each other. So that's all good. That's a nice gut check. Um, what gets more interesting is if we look at these three that I now have circled, um, which are 17,433 in orange, the 17,244 in red, and the 17,291 in yellow. And the reason these are all interesting is because you can see that we're clearly changing the number of residues present. So these are getting changing in length, as I said, by up to 60 residues. Um, but what's not happening is you're not seeing the scaling behavior or the change in the RMS values calculated from the FRED efficiencies for any of these. In fact, they all cluster right around at the same values, right? Um, and so what does that tell us? That tells us that this probe 17 here is sort of staying in the same proximity to these probes 244 and 291, independent of the presence or absence of these inserts. And so what we, we suggest is that you have an isoform independent conformational ensemble, which is mediated by interactions between the N-terminal domain or NTD and the proline rich region and the MTBR, because that's where the two probes where we see this to be true is, right, as you can see that. Um, and so that um, led us to basically, this leads to the second part of the talk, which is like, how does tau work? Um, because we are really interested in why you would have these sort of conserved long range interactions between the N terminus and this domain of the protein. Okay, so that gets us to how tau works. Um, and, all right. And, okay, so this is full length tau again. Um, I'm going to tell you about some older work from Xiao Han again, who um, was now using this construct very similar to what we used previously, which has the proline rich region and this R prime. Um, 
And this is now using FCS, again, not to belabor the, the method, but to make sure everybody understands it. Um, we're using this to look at binding between soluble tau and tubulin. Um, so tau is fluorescently labeled, tubulin is not labeled. We can, we can look at the autocorrelate the fluorescence fluctuations, again, as these diffuse through our focused laser and calculate an autocorrelation function. So what I'm showing you here is typical of an autocorrelation function where these gray represent 10 individual curves and the purple is the average of those 10 curves together. So that's typically how one would analyze FCS. You would then fit this curve, um, perhaps using the fluctuations in the individual curves as a weighting factor, and then talk about the average properties. So one of the things Shahan realized as he was um, initiating this work is that we were losing a lot of information. Um, and so what I mean by that, if I'm showing you two sets of curves now from Shahan's data, um, one is tau in the absence of tubulin, and the second is tau in the presence of tubulin. And so one of the things you can see is that we have a lot of, we have basically spread in the, in the curves here that you don't see in the absence of tubulin. And so we were trying to figure out the best way to analyze that data. And Shahan came up with the idea, rather than um, analyzing average curves, we should analyze individual curves. So this is what he did. So he would fit, he would take hundreds of curves and fit each of the individual curves. And then rather than talking about um, the average properties, although we, we did do that as well, he would um, plot distributions of those diffusion times. And so what you can see is really in this, in this comparison here is that turns out to be really useful um, because we can look at not only sort of the spread in the sizes of things that are being formed because this diffusion time is gonna scale with size, um, and, and how, how that changes as a function of the constructs that we're using. So what I'm showing you here now is a distribution of, of tau tubulin complexes um, using this construct, as well as one where we have tau bound with a protein called DARPIN. So DARPIN is an engineered protein that binds with one-to-one -one stoichiometry to a tubulin um, dimer. And you can see we have a really nice narrow distribution of diffusion times as you might expect from, a, from that kind of complex. And it's sort of striking contrast to what we see if we have tubulin bound, I'm sorry, the, the tau bound. So what you can see is not only is tau forming larger things, it's forming a much broader spread. So we call these the, the heterogeneous assemblies with tubulin. Um, and so Xiao Han made a, a bunch of scrambled constructs. Um, so he, he either started with this longer, um, with all four binding repeats, or this shorter one. Um, sorry, that's this one, which is missing R2. Um, and he, he scrambled the position of the different repeats or the, the inter-repeat regions, which link them together. And what you can see is that um, ba basically the, the size of the complexes that we form is dependent upon how many of the repeats we have. So if we look at, um, but, but not their order. So if we look at constructs that contain all four repeats, they are on average larger than those that contain just two of the repeats. I mean, three of the repeats, sorry. Although you'll see there is some, um, preference, right? So if we look at repeats that contain both, I'm sorry, constructs that contain both repeats two and three, although the order doesn't matter, they're on average larger than those that are that are do not contain both two and three, right? So there is a little bit of hierarchy in terms of binding um, preferences, but, but in general, more repeats means more binding. And he actually did a, a very a number of these constructs. So this is now looking at the median diffusion time from so the types of data sets I was just showing you. And these are the various constructs he looked at. So this is our longest ones containing both the proline retrogen and our prime. And then each of these um, is either going to be lacking one of the um, repeat regions or he's going to systematically cut off parts of the, the R prime, the R4, for the, for, and on so, so on until you're down to just these two repeat proteins. Um, and so what you can see is that there's a pretty good linear correlation here of the number, basically the size of the complex that forms in the presence of tubulin with its ability to polymerize tubulin. So along our y-axis, he carried out microtubule polymerization assays and measured the polymerization rate for each of these constructs. And what you can see is that something that binds more tubulin um, basically stimulates pol faster polymerization. So um, that is intuitive on a, some level, right? That if we are thinking about nucleating the growth of, uh, of any kind of polymer, that if we're able to increase the local concentration by binding to more of these, of these uh, tubulin dimers, then we have a higher probability of actually nucleating the process. Um, these two orange lines here on the, on the plot um, represent the diffusion time we would expect for a one-to-one -one complex between tau and tubulin. Um, and that's, that's measured um, based on 
uh, using controls to, to estimate that. And what you can see is that down here between these orange lines, we basically have a cluster um, where, where these, these guys are forming one-to-one one -one complexes, which means they're not very efficient at stimulating polymerization and their polymerization rates are much slower than these that are capable of binding more than one tubulin dimer. Okay, so given that um, we, we know there's a correlation between how many tubulin that can be bind, bound and the ability of tau to do its function. Um, and now with the work from Kristen, where we looked, saw this conserved ensemble between the N terminus and the proline rich region and the microtubule binding region. So Xiao Han's work has really focused on the microtubule binding region. But with, with Kristen's work, that really prompts us to ask, you know, what are the roles? of the domains outside the microtubule binding region in terms of tau function. And in particular, this proline rich region and the N-terminal domains, since that's where we saw the interesting uh, FRAP results. Um, so we're now using different constructs and looking at tubulin binding by FCS. So here's our full length tau. Um, this is our, our new favorite model um, tau, which has both proline rich regions and the R prime region. Um, and I just want to show you that if we, we bind, this is FCS binding with tubulin. If we look at this construct here, you see we get this nice broad distribution as we've seen previously for, for the various constructs that Shahan was looking at. Now what's striking is if we then look at any of these full length isoforms, right? So these are the different um, naturally occurring or biophysical isoforms that we've made. You can see that when this N terminus is present in any variation, we get basically a decrease both in the heterogeneity, so the width of our distribution here, as well as an overall decrease in the average size. So we, we see this as a negative regulation of the types of assemblies that tau is capable of, find, uh, of forming um, in the absence of the N terminus. Um, this is a, I mean, this is, I, I think, a really uh, nice um, experiment that Kristen did that um, sort of highlights why uh, disorder proteins are so confusing to us. She, she actually went in and she scrambled the entire sequence of these two N-terminal inserts. So um, she maintained the, the relative um, charge and hydrophobicity, but she otherwise scrambled the sequences. And what you can see is that this scrambled sequence is, is basically looks very much like the like the um, the wild type sequence. So really this loss of the, the ability of the N terminus to regulate the interaction of the tubulin is not dependent upon the, the actual presence of the uh, sorry specific sequence that's found there. Um, and then we found that this correlates with an inhibited microtubule polymerization. So these are um, curves where you're looking at an increase in light scatter upon polymerization of tubulin into microtubules. And you can see that the, the construct lacking its N-terminus is faster than any of those that are have the N-terminus present. Okay, um, and so because of the, um, basically building upon that to try and understand um, how the N-terminus was negatively regulating the uh, interactions between tau and microtubules. Um, Kristen then made a construct that corresponded only to the proline rich region. So this is our, our, our favorite model construct. And then this is just the proline rich region. And she looked to see whether or not um, it was capable of binding to soluble tubulin um, with the goal of trying to understand how the N-terminus might be regulating it. Um, and this was actually, relatively uh, striking and surprising data. Um, so again, this is the same sort of FCS distributions um, and, and the orange data are the proline rich region and the red data are this, this longer construct with the proline rich region and the MTBRR prime. Um, so if we first look at the red data, um, you'll see that, that we see an increase in diffusion time with increasing tubulin. And once we exceed one micromolar tubulin, we start to get very large um, sort of broad distributions in terms of the, the sizes of things that are, um, that are being formed. Um, if we look at the proline rich region, you can see that we also see this increase in diffusion time, but it never forms these large heterogeneous assemblies. And so this is pretty striking um, for two reasons. One, if you actually look at the red and the, the orange, they overlie each other really, really nicely up until about one micromolar, right? And so to us, that suggests that whatever is binding at low concentrations, whatever region of tau is involved, it's the same in both of these constructs because the things that we're forming are roughly the same size and have roughly the same degree of dispersion. Um, and, and so, sorry. Um, and the, the other thing you'll see is that, um, that the, there's sort of, it's maybe a little harder to see here, but there's basically two um, humps in our, in our curve here. So we, we fit the size um, of the, 
from the autocorrelation curves to our orange curves. And we have this up to one micromolar, we have binding of a single tubulin dimer. And then above one micromolar, we have binding of that second dimer. So based on that, we think that tau actually binds, um, the perylene rich region, sorry, actually binds two tubulin dimers. Um, and, and this is, um, this orange curve where we've just taken and we're now plotting the average values here. And you can sort of see this, um, this bump in the curve where we have one tubulin binding and then this is our second tubulin binding site. So what we think happens is that tau binds first, it saturates the proline rich region binding sites. And then these microtubule binding region binding sites are sort of weaker and, and distributed, meaning they're the, the positively charged patches that are distributed throughout this region, and they bind much more weakly and much more reversibly, meaning that you have constant sort of an interchange between the tubulin that are binding to these sites out here in contrast to the tighter, more stoichiometric binding that we see in the proline rich region. Um, and this is just to emphasize that point. The reason I show this, I, I mentioned it, is that if you compare the binding of uh, tubulin to the proline rich region versus these microtubule binding regions, um, you'll, you'll see that actually the microtubule binding region binds much more weakly. If, if we're missing R prime, which is the gray data down here, it really doesn't bind at all very minimally. And when R prime is present, we get some binding, but not the cooperative um, you know, tight binding that we see with the proline rich region. And then amazingly, the proline rich region is also capable of stimulating polymerization. Uh, so again, this is our polymerization assay where we're looking at polymerization of tubulin into microtubules based on light scattering, although we do have, oops, sorry, wrong way, though we do have uh, micrographs to show that these are forming microtubules. So these are uh, microtubules that are, that are um, stimulated by the presence of the proline rich region. Um, and I will say it's much weaker. It's not nearly as good at polymerizing microtubules as something, for example, that has the microtubule binding repeats as well. Um, but given that the, microtub the microtubule binding repeats alone are not capable of stimulating polymerization, I think what this really highlights is the how critical the proline rich region is in this process. Um, and I told you we'd come back to um, phosphorylation and that's where we are now. Um, so the one reason we might not be, or we shouldn't be surprised by this is um, that I, I mentioned that tau is uh, regulations with microtubules are modulated by phosphorylation. And the vast majority of those phosphorylation sites are actually found in the proline rich regions, not in the microtubule binding region. So if you wanted to um, modulate how this protein interacts with uh, tubulin and its ability to polymerize, then the proline rich region is, is an obvious place to, to have modifications where you could then um, modify that interaction. So, but I would say, despite that, it had not, prior to Kristen's work, it had not been shown that the PR had independent polymerization capacity, or even that it was capable of binding to soluble tubulin. Um, she also did some spin down assays with microtubules to show that the proline rich region binds microtubules as well, polymerized microtubules, not just tubulin. Um, I think which then raises, you know, one of the what questions we have is why, why is it not seen in any of the high resolution structures? And we don't have a good answer for that yet. Um, and then, and then, then to wrap this up, because um, this is sort of what originally what we got, we've been trying to answer is um, whether what impact does the N-terminus have on this? And so she then made constructs where she added the various N-terminal isoforms onto the proline rich region, and you can see in every single case, just like with the full length protein, the in, at presence of the N-terminus then um, decreases the binding of the proline rich region for microtubules. So this is, gets us to the what, how we think that interaction between the N-terminus and the proline rich region that we saw by FRET is basically it interferes with the ability of the proline rich region to bind, to bind tubulin. All right, so um, this is our conclusion then, um, which is, you know, how, how the evolving picture of how we think tau works, which is largely informed by the studies, you know, based on what tau looks like. Um, and so this is our model um, based on our, our FRET, as well as um, other information out in the literature of what we think tau looks like in solution, where you have the N-terminal domain here making interactions, not, not stable interactions, but long range electrostatic interactions between the proline rich region and the microtubule binding region. So this N-terminal domain is, is very negatively charged, whereas the proline rich and MTBR are positively charged. So we can think of this as sort of a gate um, for access to these regions. Um, that the proline rich region then serves as the primary um, uh, 
binding site for tubulin. So you saturate binding sites in tubulin, and then you can begin to populate at high concentrations these weaker binding sites, which are distributed through the microtubule binding lat, um, region. And then as you increase concentration, you'll eventually get polymerization. And I'll say this data, this is backed up by the, by the FRET data where you see this you know, interaction by single molecule fret, which is eliminated when you bind tubulin to these sites. So you basically decrease that electrostatic attractive interaction um, as you begin to saturate the, those positive charges with the negatively charged tubulin. And where does this leave us? Like what comes next, right? So um, we're, we're trying to understand the functional significance of tau tubulin interactions because you know more than up to 50% of the tubulin that is found in cells is actually not uh, polymerized into microtubules. It's, it's free soluble tubulin. You know, we, we show that tau has a significant interaction with tubulin. So the question is, does this have fun functional significance? And if yes, what is it? Um, whether or not it has some role in development or other is one of the questions we're looking at. Um, a question that I said motivates us from the very beginning is how does tau differentiate between binding to soluble tubulin and microtubules? Does it need to do this? And if it does, how does it do this? And then how do these post-translational modifications that are found in the proline rich region, um, how do they regulate these interactions with tubulin and microtubules? Do we see isoform dependence? And how does that fit into our you know, sort of evolving model of how tau may work? So I'll thank you for your um, attention and I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Liz, for this exciting talk. And uh, we already have a few questions. So let's start with David Nesbitt. Yeah, Elizabeth, thank you. That was really an impressive level of quantitation that you can get from uh, particularly the FCS studies. Can you go back to just any, and this is, uh, just go back to any plot of diffusion times yeah. along the y-axis and- Sure, yeah. um, like, like this yeah, one. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. So you know, this is a bit of a technical question, but you know, I guess what I want to understand is what does your x-axis mean centered around a particular species? I mean, you know, there's some way in which you're shaping the way those plots are showing such that if we integrate it over it, we would have a one-dimensional distribution function. But what is the coordinate that that is really leading to the width in your distribution in the x direction. Ah, and in the, along this direction. Correct, yeah. Oh, that, that's just for, for display of the data. So there's no, there's no width in the x direction. That's just to, to give you, because if it was all on one line, you'd have a hard time seeing how many points are at any given place. So, so that, but, that's, it. that's sort of what I was assuming, but, uh -huh. but you, 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 you end up having structure uh, in certain of your curves where there, there's even peaks uh, towards the center. So is there any bias in terms of how you plot the distribution in that X direction? Um, I would like to say no. We, we actually plotted this so many different ways trying to find the best way to represent this data. Um, and, and so the, the yeah, the, the X axis really shouldn't mean much of anything. The plots that we're showing here are, are fits to the, um, to distribution. I believe they're fits to distributions of the data um, or else they're half of a violin plot. And actually now I'm forgetting which it is, um, wh 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 how, how that's being presented. Um, but the main sort of information of the data is really sort of this distribution of diffusion times because that tells you how big the complex is. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. In in, in other words, integrated over that x coordinate. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, that it, it's it's very nice that you can keep points from overlapping so that people can really see the true densities. I, I right. understand the value in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, very nice work. Question by David Lieberman. Hi. Uh, great. In, in, insane amounts of work you've uh, you've shown us here. Um, <laughs> congratulations. Um, I, I, my question relates to um, essentially your, your last slide, which is the, the next, where to go next. Right. And, um, and it relates to the idea of you've, you've removed the N-terminal domain and you've noticed that it, 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 negatively, uh, it neg negatively relate, re regulates polymerization and other, and other factors. Um, uh, obviously, I'm just interested in what, what that does functionally to the cell. Does the cell care? Uh, does DNA now split apart at supersonic speeds? Um, you know what would what would happen if you if you 
or would it just die? So what what is the result of oh. introducing a tau without an end terminal domains back into a cell and watching the tubulin do its thing? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. And my guess is it doesn't do anything. So people have certainly made cells, not with that exact construct, but with the with the microtubule binding region, sort of con you know, similar constructs where it's expressed in cells. So the, the sort of confounding thing about tau is that um, it doesn't seem to be essential, right? You can knock down tau and it doesn't have, well, to the best of our ability it, uh, to, to observe these things doesn't seem to have major cellular defects, which suggest that there are um, other proteins that have similar roles that are able to compensate for the lack of tau. Um, so I, my guess is it would behave just fine if you put, if you sort of put these constructs in, even if you went in and used CRISPR or something to, you know, knock down the, 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 in the, in the actual um, tau variants, knocked it out. But I don't know for a fact. It's a good question. Very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ben. Thank you, Liz, for this beautiful overview of your Tau work. Really nice. Um, I had a question also looking into the future because you mentioned charge interactions. And so, as you said, phosphorylation is likely to be very important. So I, my, my question is, what's known about the extent of phosphorylation, the heterogeneity of phosphorylation, and what's the best path forward experimentally? Because um, there's usually a combinatorial explosion as soon as you start thinking about PTMs. And yeah. um, is there other well, well characterized kinases? I mean, introducing non natural amino acids with the size of protein is pretty much yeah. a nightmare. Yeah, it's a, it, th those are all great questions. So, and the answer is yeah. So, start, we'll start with your last one, which is introducing. Um, Introducing a natural amino acids is kind of a nightmare because of all the proline. So um, the, and the, well, actually that's not exactly right. The way we're trying to do it, if you want to do the site specifically, um, the way we're trying to do it, we're doing it with a combination of native chemical ligation and uh, natural amino acids. So synthesizing short fragments and the richness of prolines means that you have very few flexible sites, which you need in order to have the native chemical ligation work efficiently. So we've identified a few sites that we think are gonna work. We're going forward with that, but that's where we're, we're synthesizing the, the, the phosphorylated regions um, because we haven't had much luck trying to introduce phosphoserine using just um, using straight unnatural amino acids um, and using the enzymes that will work in, in the cells. Um, so there is a tremendous amount of data, I'd say in the past two years about which phosphorylation sites are found. Um, primarily people are interested in disease. So there's been a lot of work, particularly from Brad Hyman and colleagues lately, looking at sort of phosphorylation and tau staging across different, you know, stages of Alzheimer's disease, right? You know, which regulations are found during which staging. There was also a paper last year from the Mandelkopf lab, which looked at phosphorylation um, in under non-disease conditions. And sort of the interesting thing that their paper showed is that people tend to associate abundant phosphorylation of tau with disease. And they showed that there's abundant phosphorylation of tau even in the absence of aggregates. Um, and so, you know, the short answer to that is we don't have a great idea. Like some of the sites that are found, like, like in, the, in the Hyman work they've shown, you know, some sites are found phosphorylated almost all the time. Whereas others, it seems to be sort of sporadically, sometimes you'll have phosphorylation and maybe it increases or decreases with certain staging of the disease. Um, but I would say even at this point, we don't have a great idea of which phosphorylations are most commonly found um, relevant to function, which ones get upregulated in disease and how that, impacts function. Um, so yeah, it's a combinatorial nightmare. It's, it's, a, it's a, exactly right. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Mm -hmm. okay, next question, Nancy Ford. <clears throat> yeah, really a great talk. Um, I had a, a question about these isoforms. You said only one of them is, is expressed in developing brains. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if that is correlated with stronger or weaker uh, stabilization of microtubules, if you know. Um, yeah, so in terms of its stabilization, so the one that's expressed in development is the zero and three R isoform. So it's lacking both that, the repeat region as well as both of the inserts in the N terminus. And the, uh, so, so I'm trying to remember what's known about its binding to 
micro. So they're not generally big differences in affinity between any of these isoforms and their affinity for microtubules. What you see are differences in um, stoichiometry. So how many of them can bind to microtubules sort of under saturating conditions like you, like you would do for EM. Um, in our own hands, we don't see much of a difference in affinity for the 3R isoforms for um, soluble tubulin. It seems to have a relatively similar affinity. Um, where you see differences are in polymerization rates. So you do see, and so there are there are mild differences, um, and um, you do see differences in the phosphorylation patterns in development that you see in the adult brain. And so, and so my guess is those regulations will have a, a role in how the, that specific isoform is binding to tubulin or microtubules. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question, Tim Craggs. Well, it's uh, nice to see you and lovely data as ever. Um, it's a very technical question. Forgive my ignorance of FCS, I think. Um, the, the width in these distributions that you're getting, is that how dependent is that on the concentrations uh, that you're measuring at and also the, the time that you're measuring for? And, and are, is there additional information you can pull out of those in terms of the overall heterogeneity that's present if you were to investigate those things in terms of time and concentration dependence? Like you mean tau concentration dependence as opposed to, um, yeah, so my, my guess is we would, um, we, I know what would happen, we would start to form these very, very large assemblies, right? Because you, I think you would get, you, you, we have multiple binding sites on the you get multiple tau on some tubulins and then you would have multiple tubulins per tau and you would just sort of get this giant thing. Um, it's, it, shouldn't pull, it shouldn't form anything like a microtubule because we don't have GTP present. So this is non-assembly conditions. We don't expect to see microtubules being formed. Um, and we, I guess we did do that several years ago and showed that the assemblies, you can form very large assemblies, but it's, it's uh, totally salt dependent. You can screen it out with salt, right? So it's purely based or primarily based on electrostatics, right? So I, I think you would get very, just big, large messes of tau and tubulin. That, that's, that's my guess. Um, because even, even with these very low tau concentrations, you see we start to get relatively large things. And we, we know that some of these, um, you know, that the, this data is processed, we screen both for diffusion time as well as brightness, right? So using brightness as a readout of how many tau we may have bound to any given complex, right? And so we know that, you know, when you start to get really high tubulin, you do get these very, very bright things that get screened out in our analysis because we're trying to look at sort of these small diffusible complexes, but yeah, yes. Okay, we have a question from a big, big man and he asked me to read it. Uh, so he says, great talk, thanks. Typing question because of noisy environment. Do you think it's possible that PRRs inhibit uh, microtubule polymerization by binding MTBRs? I have this picture in my head that tau wraps around tubulin dimers. Do you think this scenario is possible based on your data? Um, let's see, let's see. Well, I, I don't, so I don't think so. Actually, this data is a good example of this, right? So this is looking at um, the binding of the microtubule binding region in the absence of the PRR. And you can see that it's just inherently weak. Um, I, there are not strong binding sites within the MTBR. Um, and this only seems to be enhanced, for example, in constructs where we have the proline rich region. So I don't think it's inhibiting the microtubule binding region binding. Um, one idea we have is that it may be important for nucleation of microtubules, but that it, in the presence of a microtubule lattice, so a growing microtubule, um, that the MTBR is able to make more um, productive interactions with that lattice and you get dissociation of the proline rich region. But we don't really have evidence for that yet. We just, we don't understand why it's not seen in structures. Like what, what is it at, when we know it binds tightly to tubulin and we know it binds microtubules, we don't understand why it um, is not present. So we're trying to under, that's one of the things we'd like to understand but we don't have a good idea right now. Okay, Hagen. Oh, thanks a lot, Liz, uh, for the wonderful talk. Um, when, when seeing your final schematics, this, this model, I actually tried to reconcile it with the FRET data um, mm -hmm. of, the, of the different constructs. And um, so I, I was a bit surprised that in the presence of tubulin, um, your FRET uh, uh, root mean square distances scale pretty well with a self-avoiding uh, random walk. Uh, I would have expected this scenario for uh, in the absence of tubulin. 
And so apparently, apparently, Tubalin by uh, uh, Tau by itself is a rather compact IDP, and then sort of extends when it binds to Tubalin. My question is, based on the cryo EM structure that you have, do you think you can sort of try to do coarse grain simulations of Tau bound to Tubalin to sort of quantitatively describe this pattern of red efficiencies that you see here in the complex? Do you think there is a way of doing that, uh, or the or is the complex too heterogeneous to to even think about it? Yeah, that's a, a great, a really great question and a great idea. Um, we are we are currently have some efforts trying to model just the proline rich region in tubulin, right? So we we sort of using that as a starting point to um, understand, you know, the, the binding that we see in the polymerization. Um, I, I think, yeah, if there's anybody out there who wants to try to model um, Talbonto microtubules based on our data, I would we'd love to talk to you because I think that's well beyond my capabilities, but I think it's a super, it's a super interesting, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big floppy protein bound to a big lattice. So it's a big, it's a big challenging problem, I think, from a computational perspective. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, so I was going to ask you a question, Liz, but it seems that Hagen asked exactly the question that okay. I did. <laughs> so uh, uh, I guess there are no more questions in the chat. So if that's the case, then I would like to thank you again for a great talk. And thank you all for staying till the end of this uh, question session. And I hope to see you all in two weeks uh, for the talk by John Shea from uh, UC Santa Barbara. And uh, see you around. In the ether. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Bye -bye you. Then. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Helen. <laughs>